Next, I'm going to share with you my meme for tonight. And this meme, this guy here, Costi Hinn, Costi Hinn says, the devil loves unity that ignores truth. You agree with that? Loves unity that ignores truth. I mean, oh, you, unity. And that's the whole idea of this one world government, right? Ignores truth. Do you, anybody know who Costi Hinn is? You never heard of him. Do you know anybody with the last name Hinn? Benny Hinn. That's his nephew. He got out of that group, and I'm going to read that to you for a second, but I want, I want you to re refresh on who Benny Hinn is. This is, a, this is less than two minutes of Benny Hinn. <laughs> so, <laughs> just a little video, just to remember who Benny Hinn is, and this is his nephew, and his nephew was involved with that all his life as a kid. So. <laughs> you may not understand this. I don't either. I don't either. But when the Lord talks to me, I obey him. We break it in the name of the Now you tell me, is that the Holy Spirit? Is that another spirit? That's the, that's the spirit of Vincent Mann. <laughs> but that, you know, that, WWF. Yeah. WWF. <laughs> but you know, there's probably a thousand people there, yeah. and and they go to that and they get into it, and it's just there's nothing there. That I don't, I can't read the Bible and see any of that. That is just completely nuts. So, but his nephew, um, Costi Hinn, was in that church growing up, and let me read you this. Nephew of the world famous, they call him world famous, should be infamous. World famous televangelist Benny Hidd had a front row seat to the inner workings of the prosperity gospel. In one sermon I heard growing up, my uncle taught us that if we wanted God to do something for us, we needed to do something for him. And he wrote a book. He's got an excellent book. In God, Greed, the Prosperity Gospel, he gives a chilling account of how prosperity preachers exploit the poor and needy and what it was like to grow up in one of the world's most powerful prosperity dynasties. As Costi began to question the lifestyle he was living and look for an answer to the injustice he saw, he found himself on a journey that eventually led him to abandon the family faith in favor of the overwhelming truth about the real Jesus Christ. Now, I wonder how their family reunions are. But anyways. <laughs> <laughs> but he says, the devil loves unity and ignores truth. And that, that is so true. But most churches never preach anything that will cause anybody to question anything because they don't distinguish between what is truth and what is, what is uh, untruth. It's basically just kind of gray and fuzzy. So everybody's okay. But there's a couple of verses here that I love. And I'm going to go over this verse again when I go through our, three, our, 12, our last four principles. Second John 1 John 1.4 I rejoice greatly that I found your children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. Now, John wrote that. He, he wrote the Gospel of John. Then he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He wrote the book of Revelation. John wrote a lot in the New Testament. He was the youngest disciple, remember. But um, he wrote this here, and this was probably around just before he wrote the book of Revelation, maybe within five to ten years of Revelation when he wrote this here, probably. So um, he, he's talking about this book here in 2nd John. It's just one chapter. It's about the personal walk of the believer. 
And I'm going to look at verse 7 real quick in this book because it kind of ties this together. And John says this, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is coming to flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So that's what he says. Then verse 8, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have worked for, but that we receive a full reward. So in 2 John, John says the things you work for, be careful that you don't lose your reward, that you get a full reward. God wants us to get a full reward. He wants to give us more than just the salvation he gave us, which is absolutely amazing. But he says your full reward. So the truth is, unity without truth isn't unity, is it? It's basically compromise, it's tolerance, it's basically, you know, everybody's okay, everybody believes everything. You need to have unity in the church. And that's why I always try to distinguish between false and truth all the time. And that bothers some people. They don't like to hear that. They want to hear that everything's, everybody's the same, everything's okay. But you've got to take the Bible and try to, this is what it says. Now, obviously, I don't know everything perfectly in the Bible exactly, but, I, but there's the main doctrines of the Bible we can stand strong on because we know what the Bible truly says. And so, in Ephesians 4.13, it says, Until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the state, stature of the fullness of Christ. So Ephesians is talking about, hey, we, we get into that point, where you get to that point, coming to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, which is a complete man. Um, that word there is, uh, it's, it's, it means um, complete, not necessarily perfect, perfect, like, like Christ was, but it means you're, you're growing to the point. It's, a, it's the word we get our word telescope. I can't remember the exact word, for it, but it means you are progressing, okay? And so, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, in Ephesians 4.13. Now I'm going to turn to a verse here in 2 John 3.16, because I think this is pretty cool. It says here, unto a perfect man. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 says this, All scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All scripture. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now it's a little different Greek word there for the word perfect there in, in verse 17, but it basically means the same thing. It means complete. It means you've grown up, you've matured. And so how do you get matured? You learn God's word, the Bible, and you learn what it says, the truths of the Bible. So I think it's kind of cool that Costa Hid came out of that, that group, and, and now he's writing about it. So it's, it's good because there's some people that get stuck in that, and it's, it it's really makes you sad when you think about it, to think that this is what they picture as Christianity. And we look at that and say, what has that got to do with Christianity? It just, it's just bizarro world. Really, it is. So that's the, the, the meme I have here tonight. So now you know who Costi Hinn is. Okay, so prophecy update. Now there's so many of these I could cover. There's so much stuff going on so fast. Uh, like I, I said earlier, uh, we we're talking uh, Sweden has just joined NATO. Um, Israel is sending early warning systems to Ukraine. Russia's not happy about it. So there's so much going on. But here, this one here, Russia invites Palestinian factions to meet te February 26th. Russia has invited Palestinian factions to meet in Moscow on February 26th. So this is already over a week ago. The Palestinian Authority Prime Minister said Sunday, adding that the PA was ready to engage with Hamas. Russia has invited all Palestinian factions who will be meeting on the 26th of this month in Moscow. So Russia's got their fingers in all these different areas. So Russia's kind of... You know, you, as you know, that Russia does turn against Israel and comes down and attacks Israel, according to Ezekiel 38. And we see this all forming. And Russia's got their hands into all these nations that we know that we talk about in Ezekiel 38. And so here's another one. Um, Iran sends Russia hundreds of ballistic, ballistic missiles. And I believe it was 400 that I heard that they sent. But Du Bois... Uh, Iran has provided Russia with a large number of powerful surface-to-surface -surface ballistic missiles. Six sources told Reuters, uh, deepening the military cooperation between the two U.S. sanctioned countries. So these two countries are working together, and so many of the other ones are too. And so you can see this all developing the way the Bible says it is. And it, it's, it's really quite interesting that 
it's getting prepared. We don't know when this battle between Russia and these nations are against Israel, but we know we're get, we're, it's set up right now. All the pieces are in place. So I thought that was interesting. Okay, next I'm going to show you our apologetic. And if you thought last week's, when we talked about that Upa fish or whatever it was that went up the uh, 400 feet uh, waterfall, that, that that was crazy, this one is absolutely will blow your mind, okay? This here is uh, called a bobtail squid, so... You know, in the Pacific Ocean, there lives this little tiny squid called the bobtail squid. And he is unique amongst, I think, all the creatures of creation uh, in that what he does to survive. You see, the bobtail squid comes out at night to feed on plankton and other things. He has to swim up near the surface of the ocean at night. But he's like a little popsicle for all the other fish down below. I mean, we're talking a pretty yummy little treat doesn't swim very fast, the other fish are just going to gobble him down. They love bobtail squids. So what's he going to do? He's got to hide. But how do you hide up at the top of the ocean when there's all these fish below you? Well, this little squid has a special pouch on his underside, like his stomach. So during the day, he collects bioluminescent bacteria in this little pouch under his stomach. Then at night, when it's dark, He's up near the surface, remember. If there's a full moon, he reveals a lot of these bacteria, so his underbelly looks like the moon shining down, and the fish, they think, oh, there's the moon. They don't realize it's a squid and they don't eat him. If there's a half moon, he only reveals half of the bacteria. If a cloud comes over the moon, he knows to cover up the bacteria so that it no longer looks like there's a moon shining or if it's, there's no moon that night. So he not only is able to use a completely different feature, creature to disguise himself, he's able to modify the amount of light coming from those bacteria. Then, during the day, he dumps that load of bacteria, grabs some more, otherwise they develop and there's too many of them, and he does the same thing the next night. So here you have a squid using bacteria to survive unbelievably complex. He has to have the pouch, he has to have the instincts, he has to know what to do with them, he has to know the right kind of bacteria. How in the world does a stupid little squid know all this stuff? Because he's been programmed by his creator to create this disguise. Evolution cannot explain these things, but God's existence does. So as you go through every day, look around at the marvels of creation and give the credit where credit belongs to our Creator God. I mean, isn't that amazing? <laughs> but to me, that just that's just crazy. I mean, if somebody watched this and still believed in evolution, I may not be cruel and come out and call them an idiot, but I would think it. <laughs> I would dunk it. Okay. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I mean, this is amazing, the way God created everything. This stuff can't just happen. It's like, it's like programming the software, you know. It's, 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 to me, it's amazing. Okay, so lesson 6C, we're on the details of the judgment in our study of the five crowns of Scripture, our rewards and crowns. Um, there's, we're going through principle 9 through 12, actually 9 through 13, because I, I came up with one myself, so we're going to go through these five tonight. And then next week we'll move on to our, our next topic. So we have seven more after tonight, and then we'll be done So through, as, our, as we get into these crowns. So um, tonight we're going to look at principle number um, 9 through 13. And so number 9, and the first verse I'm going to look at is Matthew 7 here in just a second. But if we judge others, Jesus would judge us with the same standard. And I've never thought of this before. But you know what? I think that depending on how we are and how harsh we are and how we don't show mercy or grace, that, is it possible that God would look at it and say, hey, I'm going to judge you with the same value and standard? You know, now, we, a lot of times we look at this and we think, well, this is only talking about here on this world. But no, I think it may be talking about the Bema Seat too. Because you look at Matthew 7, verse 1 and 2, and I like the way the New American Standard says it, do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. So as we're 
we judge, we have to be careful, don't we, how we judge things. We have to be, understand. Sometimes we look at outward appearance and we make these judgments, don't we? And we have to be careful about it. Now, the Bible does not state how this will be done, but we must show mercy. We have to consider that, hey, it's telling us here, as you judge, with the implication, if you judge harshly, you're going to be judged harshly, right? So James 2.13 says, he, For he shall have judgment with, for he shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy, and mercy rejoices against judgment. Basically, we need to show mercy, don't we? We should have mercy. Don't we sometimes like to look at somebody that has fallen and, and, and look at it and say, look at that person and that, not realizing that, hey, it could have been us? It, we have to be careful. That doesn't mean we condone sin or we tolerate sin or things like that, but we just have to understand that, hey, we need to show mercy on others because things happen. And we have to understand that. And if somebody comes to Christ, they ask for forgiveness, they confess their sins, and they want to be reconciled, we have to reconcile. And we're going to talk about that here in a little while. But as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So it tells us we need to be careful how we judge, how we criticize others. We need to show mercy, right? So the point, I think, here in number 9, if we judge others, Jesus will judge us with the same standard. We need to be careful that we're showing mercy. And sometimes we just don't do that because of our old natures. We like to, you know, on people. And we just have to have, be merciful, I think. Like I said, that doesn't mean we tolerate sin or condone it. But we just have to understand that when somebody happens or somebody does something, that we just have to be merciful in our judgment. So that was number nine. Let's go ahead and look at number ten. And it says here, um, the ministry to others, your ministry to others will be rewarded. I think that's pretty straightforward, common sense, right? As we all help each other in different ministries, um, you get rewarded for that. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19, it says, For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of rejoicing? Are not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? So your influence on others is extremely important. How we influence others. Uh, we can present the gospel to somebody. Obviously, you've heard the saying before, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't force him to drink, right? You can give the gospel, you can hand out a track, you can invite somebody to church, you can't force them to get saved. That's, that's between them and God, them and the Holy Spirit. But you can bring them to the point of getting them to understand it, and they have to make that decision. And it's their choice. They may make that decision years later. And I know there's plenty of people that have been witnessed to, and they've gotten saved years and years and years later. And sometimes it's just, you know, when God it clicks in their mind and they understand it, and they, they trust Christ as Savior. But our influence on ministry, our influence on children, our influence on each other, you know, everything we do together as a team in ministry, that your ministry to others is going to be rewarded. So we have to understand that. Now, 2 John chapter 1, verse 4, and I'm not, this is the verse we looked at already. I'm going to start with Costi Hinn. But it says, I rejoice, rejoice greatly that I found your children walking in the truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. So, John is excited here that, hey, he looks at these people, they're walking in truth, and he's excited about it. And the, the neat thing about this, if John's excited, don't you think God's excited? You know, when we have a church or a group of people in a Bible study or a Sunday school class or whatever it is, and you teach them and they all, we all learn together, we all understand things together, don't you think God is extremely happy when we're in truth and we're in unity and he sees that with the church? That's what he always wanted, for us to all be in unity. So I'm going to look at a verse here in 2 John, uh, verse 1, verse 5. And we looked at this already, a couple of verses, 8 and 9. But I want to look at verse 5 again, or here. And it says, And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. Because remember in verse 4 he says, I rejoice greatly that I found your children walking in truth, as ye have received a commandment from the Father. And then he goes on in verse 5 and he says, the commandment here, that as ye have heard from the beginning, we should, or in verse 5, that we love, the, heard from the beginning that we love one another. So Christians should love each other. We should love one another. We should all basically want the best for each other. And so here, ministry to others, we want to help each other. We want to work together as a team. And then there's another verse here, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Paul says here, brethren... If a man be overtaken in a fault. Now that word fault there refers to sin or to fall. To you which are spiritual, restore. It means to bring back. Such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself unless you also be tempted. 
it's kind of like we just talked about mercy, didn't we? But the truth is, if somebody falls, we need to try to restore that person the best you possibly can. That person obviously has to want to do the third part right. They want to come back to God. They have to ask for forgiveness. Hey, I, I, I made a mistake. I did something wrong and come back. But we should be willing to bring that person back. We should always be willing to restore people. And it's called love. It's called, hey, you which are spiritual, restore such a one. In the spirit of meekness, consider yourself unless you also be tempted. Now, you all know the story of John Mark, and we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. But we all are in ministry, and we focus on each other's, on others. And when something happens to some other person, we just have to go alongside them as a brother or sister in Christ and try to get them to come back and to serve Christ. And, and that's why we always need to encourage each other, right? People, we all need encouragement. So that was number 10. Now number 11 tells us this. Teachers will receive the stricter judgment. And that's true, right? The Bible says that. In uh, James 3.1, and I like the way the New King James says this, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Um, isn't it interesting that there's many and I don't mean to say this cruelly or harshly, many lazy preachers and teachers out there. I knew a pastor here in Lafayette, and I'm not going to give a name, but he, this is the way he preaches, like this. And he's just like he's talking to you, and he never says anything in the Bible. It's like he's leaning against his pulpit, and it's like he never really teaches anything. And there's, we've gone to adult Sunday school classes at places here in Lafayette, and Chris and I just shook our head afterwards. We wondered, what would, they didn't even open their Bible. They didn't even teach anything. And I'm not saying that to be critical or cruel, but it's true. Teachers, if you're going to be a teacher, if you're going to be a pastor, you better be careful that you put the work in. You know, this is not just supposed to be some kind of easy job that, you know, that you stand up in front of people. Why? You've you got to take this seriously. You're going to receive the stricter judgment you are. Because if I'm up here and I'm teaching you something false and something wrong, you know, that's something for me to be concerned about. I better be concerned about that. And anybody that you know, is standing in front of people or that is teaching or writing a book or anything, you better be careful about what you're teaching and you're saying. It's extremely important because if you're teaching something false, you're going to be judged for that. You're going to, it's, it's going to be stricter judgment. So don't take that position or idea of being a pastor or a teacher lightly. It's, it's extremely important. Put the work in, put the time in, uh, pray and think about what you're teaching and put the study in. Uh, 1 Timothy 1 verse 7 says, Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. So there's people that desire that position to stand up in front of people. Now, who would ever do that? The worst, scariest thing in the world is standing in front of people and talk. You know that, right? I mean, some people said they'd rather be in a casket than stand in front of people because it is, it's scary. But they don't work to obtain the knowledge to actually teach anything. The Bible talks about sound doctrine, faithful interpretation of the Bible, and it's not fruitless. It's not empty teaching. You should be actually teaching something that the Bible says. Somebody should go home and say, I learned something today. If you go to a church service and you sit in that church service and you leave afterwards and you say, what did I learn today from the Bible? And you can't think of anything you learned from the Bible, then you're probably going to the wrong place, seriously. But that's the truth. You, you need to learn God's word. Why do you think he left that for us? So here, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor wherever they affirm. It's a rebuke right there. And here's another one. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. For the time will come, and I think the time has came, <laughs> for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itch and ears. So it's set prime for teachers to get up and say whatever they want, to tell stories, and, and on and on, and just never teach anything really solid. Because people are, that's what they want. But you know what? We don't teach people what they want. We teach people what God wants them to hear. We teach them the Bible. Some people may not like that. They may leave and never come back. You may get a nasty comment. You may get a, a nasty something on Facebook or email or a text. Or they may talk to somebody about this. You know, then, but you know what? So what? You're teaching God's word. Stay on God's word. Don't worry about what you're teaching, as long as you're teaching God's Word. Because people do not want to be convicted. They don't want to hear 
what God really has to say. If they did, they would be studying them by their Bible themselves, wouldn't they? Having their devotions, and most people don't. Very few people. But the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Now, sound doctrine is doctrine. It means teaching, solid teaching, but after their own lust. In other words, what makes my flesh feel good? Show heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. That's why everybody likes somebody that's funny, that's cute, and, and tells stories, and really entertains them. Um, Many teach what is easy to digest. In other words, well, oh, that's I like that. Non-confrontational. It's gray. It's foggy. It's vague. And that's what most people hear in most pulpits or churches. People like easy light teaching. They don't like teaching that gets to their heart and gets them to think that I need to change my life. And so, but you know what? That's what God's word does. If you read God's word and you think well, this is what it's trying to say to me, you're going to be convicted, and it's going to cha change your life if you really follow it the way for what it says. So as far as teachers goes, you'll receive stricter judgment. So be careful how and what you teach. That is extremely important. Okay, so the number 12. Your contribution to ministry will be rewarded. Okay, this sounds very similar to the one we just talked about, number 10 I think it was. But what you give to ministry, you'll be rewarded for that because you're, you're feeding in that ministry and helping that ministry. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 through 8. And I know you know, I know all of you know these verses here. He says, Paul says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So that neither is he that plants anything, neither he that waters, but God gives the increase. Now he that plants and he that waters are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now you, you hear people a lot of times saying, I want people to Christ, this and that, and I have 20 people, 30, 40, 50 people. Truly, you may give somebody the gospel, but God's the one that saves them, right? I mean, you, we know that, right? Jesus Christ died for their sins, and that person has to make the personal decision to trust Jesus Christ as Savior. And so we can feed people. We can do all the things that it talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 through 8, but God gives the increase. And so now he that plants, he that waters are one. Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So we all have input, right? We all can do something. We all should. You invite somebody to church. You give somebody a tract. You invite somebody to a, a church function of some kind, uh, uh, the, the baby shower, so on, different things that we do or just have somebody over and get to know them, befriend them, and you can kind of get people where they'll come to um, listen to what you have to say, and that's part of our job to do that. So how you support others in ministry is important. We are to work in harmony as a unit. We should all be functioning together like a bunch of gears in a watch, right? To making this thing work so that it works correctly. And we all get the credit for that. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3, or 2 Corinthians 6, 3, I mean, it says, giving no, this is kind of the other side of the coin here, giving no offense. Now, what does that mean, offense? Don't lead people into error. Don't cause people to stumble. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. Now, there, there can people that actually can oppose a ministry and have a negative influence on a ministry and murmur and gripe and complain, and then people will never really get saved or they'll never really understand it. And so you have to be very careful. We as a church, we're a body. We do have an effect on each other, the way we act. Young, new, young Christians will come to church and we, we will talk to them, we'll share things with them, and we'll try to teach them things or, or go alongside and bring them alongside. Uh, new people come to church. They're all watching, aren't they? I mean, you don't realize it, but somebody comes to church for the first time. They're evaluating you. They're evaluating their sermon. They're evaluating everything. They're trying to decide, do I, am I going to fit in here? Is this what I like? So we have to be on our toes. We have to be the best we can for people when they come here. And so giving no offense in anything, that ministry be not blamed. Because the way we act, if we act the wrong way, or we do something in an incorrect way and it offends somebody. Now, you're gonna, if you offend somebody with God's word, you offend somebody with God's word. That's just the way it is. But be careful about how we influence people that we're doing it positively. Because you're, you will reward it if you influence them positively. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11 says this. You know the story of John Mark. How Paul didn't want to use him anymore because he turned away. But it says, take Mark and bring him with you. For he is profitable to me for the ministry. So... John Mark was reconciled. I think, I don't know if all of us have, but there's times we've all kind of slid back, right? We've kind of all drifted away, and we, we 
we kind of like, you know, for a time period. I remember when I first got saved and I went to secular college, you wouldn't know of me from a Christian from Adam, not really. But then I finally realized that, hey, I need to get this thing straightened out. And that happens a lot of times with us. We, we go through these time periods, but like John Mark here, Paul says, okay, now he's profitable, bring him back. And God will always bring you back as a Christian. Now, you can do some things that can have a bad effect, so you have to be, people, nobody's saying that we should ever drift back, we should always grow forward. But the point here is that, you know, it does happen, and people need to be reconciled. People can fall, and they can come back, okay? So we have to understand that, that we have to be that positive influence on people. If they ever want to come back and serve Christ again, we just have to be there for them and to help them along. Okay, I've got another one, the 13th, the one that I, I actually made, and I'm going to show that to you here next. And that is, your life matters, YLM, your life matters. Time is short, walk by faith. Okay, so this is something that you and I should consider all the time. And many times I'll be out, you know, with, when I'm around some people, I always think, you know what, everybody's going to die. And what, how I influence them matters, and I need to walk by faith. I need to have the courage to step up by faith. Philippians 2.12, one of these verses that many people misinterpret that believe in works for salvation. Uh, and, and what they should do is read the whole chapter, because this whole chapter of Second Thessalon- or, or Philippians chapter 2, you know what it's about? It's all about being Christ-like. He is the pattern where to be like him, and that's the whole point of this chapter, Philippians chapter 2. But it says, Wherefore, my beloved, my beloved fellow Christian, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It doesn't say work for your salvation. How can somebody say, I'm saved by grace, but I've got to work out my salvation, I've got to work for my salvation? That doesn't make any sense, does it? How can people say that? It does, it's, it's just weird. But there's people that will go to this verse and say, you've got to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. No, this is not talking about your salvation. Your salvation is secure in Christ. What he did on the cross, he did for you, and your sins have been paid for. But now that you're a Christian, be careful about how you live your life. It's like somebody that would be drafted onto the Indianapolis Colts. They're a cult. They're, they're signed a contract. They just sit on the bench and they don't do anything, right? What kind of good player is that? Just like we're on, with Christ. We are a Christian. We're saved. Now we should act like a Christian. We should bring about a better result. So when it says work out your salvation, it's talking about, hey, you're saved. Now put the effort forward to be the best that you can be because your life matters. It's important. Your life, it's, God created you for a purpose and for a reason. And now as you know him as your personal savior and you serve him, it is going to be important what you do. So now in James 4.14, it says this, whereas... Now, this is the second part. Time is short. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. I don't think anybody ever goes out and, and thinks, well, I'm going to go out here and some semi is going to drive through a red light and hit me and, and I'm going to die in a car accident. People don't think that, do they? But it happens all the time. Life is short. And so we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We may not be here, you know, and, and we got to realize our life is a vapor. It appears for a little time and vanishes away. It, it just seemed like I was talking to Chris today. Do you realize this July, my high school is having a 50th anniversary high school reunion? That is weird. I mean, it's just completely weird. How, where, where did the other 30 years come from? You know, I'm, <laughs> it's only been 20 years, but it's, it's, 50, it's just weird, isn't it? You think about how time goes by so fast. And so... Our life truly is like a vapor, isn't it, compared to God? So we have to use our lives the best way we can. And one of my favorite verses I love here, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. And that's something we should always think. Before we do something, okay, am I doing what God's will wants me to do, or am I doing what I think is best for me? Consider what God's will is for your life and not your own evaluation. I mean, when you take... Um, input from people that you respect. Be careful that they're giving you spiritual input, not just worldly input. So consider what God wants in your life. Consider what the Bible says and walk by faith. I'm going to trust you and I'm going to do what you want me to do because I know that's what's important. And it's, 
it's not the idea of that what I'm going to do is try to extend my life and do the best I can for my life in this world, because that's going to be gone just like that. What's important is what you're going to do for Christ, because your life matters, time is short, we need to walk by faith. So that's something for us to remember. Okay, I'm going to read a little quote now, and this is from, I'm not sure I'm saying this guy's name, Adoniram Judson. Anybody ever hear him, Adoniram J Judson? Okay, and here's a quote that he, he said. And I thought this was a pretty good quote. It's a quote on your service to God while on this earth, or your servant or your discipleship. He says, a life once spent is irrevocable. It will remain to be contemplated throughout eternity. The same may be said of each day. When it is once passed, it is gone forever. All the marks which we put upon it will exhibit, for e will exhibit forever. Each day will not only be a witness of our conduct, but will affect our everlasting destiny. Now, I, I don't think he's saying works for salvation there, but it almost sounds like it. But. How shall we then wish to see each day marked with usefulness? It is, too, it is too late to mend the days that are past. The future is our power, in our power. Let us then each morning resolve to send the day into eternity in such a garb as we shall wish it to wear forever. And at night, let us reflect that one more day is irrevocably gone, indelibly marked. So the point, I think, is how you interpret what he's saying and I think that the way we should see this is you know once a day is gone it's gone what have we done that wanted anything for Christ what have we done for him and so that's something we always have to remember that every time and everything we do on this earth should have an influence um, for eternity and that's the way we should always look for look at things in a perspective from eternity okay so that's what I have for tonight um, let's go ahead and um, look at our prayers